So now that we have a basic overview of what a hardware description language is and what Verilog is and how the abstractions go, we'll dive down into the Verilog syntax. And we start with the basic, basic, basic thing, which you'll probably never use, which is a primitive. So Verilog, in the end, it describes Boolean logic gates, so or it, it should turn into Boolean logic gates. So we have primitives for these Boolean functions, nots, ands, ors, etc. Here's a full list of what we have. And to write one of these things, like take this or gate over here, which has the inputs in one and in two and the output out, we would write the word or with parenthesis, and then we would write in order the output, comma, in one, comma, in two, and a semicolon to end it. Um, that is not a wonderful way to describe an OR gate, because as you see, we have to order these uh, inputs, and it, it, it's kind of like a very um, uh, structural description, which is hard to read. So we won't use this much, but that, those are the basic types of low-level primitives that we have inside Verilog. The other thing is, well, you see we have this in one and in two and out, they're signals. So the signals, since they're um, logic signals, they can have four primary states. There are more things in Verilog, but they're not uh, synthesizable and we don't usually use them. So the four states that we discuss are zero, uh, logic zero, usually like a ground voltage, one, which is a logic one, a VDD voltage, X, which is something where we don't know if it's a zero or one, and I, I put the X here red and a lot of simulators will make them in some sort of a uh, emphasized way because this is something that either hasn't been initialized or it is some sort of an error and we have a z or a high z which means that we have a high impedance state and we can drive something else onto the signal so those are the four states we'll use primarily zero and one x is usually a mistake and z we have when we have tri-state things but it doesn't appear as much wires are um, these types of nets and Verilog, for some reason, has this differentiation between wires and registers, and it doesn't really matter why. In fact, in System Verilog, they've kind of fixed this and changed this whole concept. But in general, we have this thing called wires and regs, and I will explain later on how we um, get our code to compile and what the difference between them is. But just in general, wires do not keep state and registers do keep state, and we'll explain the exact little uh, fine details about that later. Um, Wires and registers can represent buses or groups of signals. So often we don't want to take a 32-bit bus and uh, write 32 separate signals, um, wire 1, wire 2, wire 3, etc. So we bus them together with this square bracket notation. So if I want to just write a single bit, I'll write wire in 1, comma in 2, etc., um, semicolon. That's how I declare a wire. For a reg, which I, again I'll explain the difference later, I write reg and out. That's a 1-bit um, reg. Um, then again, when I want a bus of wires, I'll write wire, then I'll, in the square bracket notation, I'll write the MSB colon LSB, and then the name of the bus. So now I'll have data, zero, data one, data two, and so forth. And since we start with MSB down to LSB, this can also be translated into like an 8-bit number. Um, can do the same thing with reg. In fact, we can also make wires and regs be um, two-dimensional. It's with this strange notation where we start with uh, the square brackets before the name of the signal, then the square brackets after the name of the signal. And as you can see, um, reg 31 to 0, mem 0 to 7, this, these are 32-bit words, um, with, of, uh, and there are eight of them. So that is a way that I would basically say that I have a memory array which has 32-bit uh, words, and they're uh, altogether eight words. Okay, so that's the way to do it in Verilog. In System Verilog, we can um, do multi-dimensional uh, arrays with more dimensions than that. In Verilog, there are extensions for packed and unpacked um, data types, but I won't go into that here. So the basic constructs basically that we do use more often in Verilog than the primitives that I showed uh, on the previous slide are the operators. And we have different types of operators. So we have AND and OR, and then bitwise AND and bitwise OR. And we have this type of a knot. We also have a bang or an exclamation point, which is also a knot, and different things like that. So what we'll usually write is if we want to describe this type of an OR gate, we'll use one of these either or um, which is a uh, vector wise or or a bitwise or we'll write something like this out equals in one or 
into, and that makes the same description as the or primitive that we saw on the previous slide. And that's uh, a bit more readable, and uh, we'll see we'll have to add in a sign keyword to before that. But this is uh, usually how we will um, show uh, Boolean uh, functionality. Constants. So constants have a strange format in Verilog. Um, it's width and then a apostrophe and then um, the type of, uh, of encoding and then the value. So for example, that kind of was strange, to say zero, just a bit of zero, we do one because it's a one bit number this apostrophe B means we're going to be binary and then zero. So one apostrophe B zero is a single bit binary zero. Okay. Um, so if we want a bus or a longer, uh, a, lo a longer uh, constant, we have, for example, a four bit binary, we do four apostrophe B zero zero one one. And that will give us the binary the uh, one one or the if it's in decimal, that would be three. Okay. Um, often, if we are using binary encoding, we get these very long words. So we want to use hexa. Hexa, we just take every four bits of binary and turn it into one hexa. So uh, we can write eight because this is going to be eight bits. So this number is how many bits we have in the vector. Eight apostrophe H for hexa. FF is one, 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 one and then another one, 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 one. So it's an eight uh, bit hexa, uh, hexadecimal, and that in decimal comes out 255. Uh, often we like to work in decimal because that's how we think. So we can also just write D here, 255, and it will of course translate all these things into binary, uh, eight bit binary uh, um, word, but we can use those types of encodings. Okay, next we'll discuss the, the heart of Verilog, which is the procedural box. So actually, we'll start with the initial block, which is the behavioral high level, uh, high level of uh, Verilog. And as I said before, the behavioral high level abstract is non-synthesizable, and it's not how we describe um, our hardware, but actually how we describe our tests. So an initial block means that we're going to use do something at the beginning of our simulation, at the initial point. So anything that comes inside an initial block, block starts at t equals zero. So it's executed only once at the first time the time unit is called. For example, initial begin a equals zero, b equals zero, uh, and we put uh, several um, commands between a be uh, begin and an end, and this will um, will start our uh, will set our a and b to zero at the beginning of the simulation but that obviously we cannot um, do in hardware we have to put some sort of a uh, a structural thing to, to actually ha uh, make that happen and that will do with what we call an always block okay they're also always in behavioral and we'll see it later when we see a test bench example so it, with always blocks, statements are evaluated when a change in the sensitivity list occurs. So as I mentioned before, there is something called a sensitivity list, which is which signals actually cause whatever is inside a block of code to be evaluated. So an always block, and then the sensitivity list comes after it, anything that's inside the sensitivity list will cause the simulator to look inside that always block and do whatever code is inside. So for example, and this is a classic example, and we'll see many of them, and I'm showing you kind of classic examples so you'll get used to them. We have always, this is at, so at after it comes a sensitivity list. And inside the sensitivity list, we have this word posage, which is a keyword in, uh, in Verilog and clock that's the name of the signal so every time we get a positive edge a rising edge of a signal called clock so we have a signal that happens to be called clock that is a word clock it's not a saved word and this is a positive edge so every time we reach this singular point where the edge rises we'll go in and do whatever code this is so what the code says if not, the exclamation point is a not, and reset, Q gets zero. So that is a reset, it's a negative uh, level reset. So every if it goes into this block, it checks what the reset signal state is. If the reset is low, because not and reset means if n reset equals zero, then this evaluates to one and we go into here, then Q, the output gets zero. It resets the flop. Else, Q gets D, and that actually turns directly into a flip-flop. 
where? Okay, the flip-flop, this pin is called clock. Here we have a negative um, pin called N reset. Okay, and here we have a data pin, and here we have an output pin. So this directly turns into this. And that is basically an asynchronous reset um, flip-flop. Why is it asynchronous? Because, uh, excuse me, that's a synchronous reset clock. Why is it synchronous? Because we only evaluate this code on the posage of the clock. If reset, for example, goes down over here, let's say that's n reset, it will only be evaluated at the rising edge of the clock. The output q will stay whatever it was, let's say it was high, and then it will go down only at the pause edge of the, uh, at the pause edge of the clock. So that's a synchronous reset. We also have what's called an asynchronous reset, which we show this way, always at either pause edge clock or neg edge reset. So either when the clock rises or the end reset signal goes down, then we go in here. When we go in, we have the same code. So if we go in and reset is low, then uh, we have a zero else. This is also load enabled. We have another signal called load enable. If load enable is high, then Q equals D. If load enable is not high, then Q stays the same. So what we get here is another flip flop with, we have clock here. We have our negative edge reset. And we have an enable. It's called load enable. And we have our D and we have our Q. Okay, in this case, because we had both pause edge clock and neg edge reset in the sensitivity list, it, it, at this point when reset went down, already our Q would have gone down. Now, at the rising edge of the clock, we go into this block again. But when we go into the block, we ask what is the state of reset? And we see, we see it's low. So uh, Q stays low. So as long as N reset will be low, um, the output will stay low. Okay, so those are our procedural blocks, and there are two types of all these blocks, and this is really the heart of writing any uh, RTL. Okay, so the two types of all these blocks are first the sequential block, and that's what we saw on the previous slide. So a sequential block is used mainly for describing flip-flops. So as we saw before, this code over here is a um, uh, rising edge flip-flop with a low reset signal, that has a load enable also on it, okay? And how do we find out or differentiate between a sequential always block and the next type, which is a combinational one, which we'll see in a second, when there is a clock signal in the sensitivity list? So we have pause edge clock, there's a rising edge clock in the sensitivity list, and that means that this is a sequential um, always block, okay? These always, always, always translate into flip-flops or latches, um, we're going to almost always want to describe flip-flops. Latches are a special type of a, um, of a design style, and usually you're going to want to stay away from them unless you really know what you're doing and you have good reason to use a latch. So I'm not going to discuss much about latches in this course. The second type of always block is the combinational block. The combinational block describes the logic. It's purely combinational. There are no clocks that actually are in the sensitivity list causing anything synchronous to happen inside. It's just a kind of a um, programming language or high level or, or, or human kind of reading type of way to describe um, combinational logic, to de describe Boolean functionality. So what we can see here is always at A or B or C. So if A, B or C change from zero to one or from one to zero, then we go and evaluate what's in here and we get out equals A and B and C. So this basically just tells us that we have a three input AND gate with A, B and C at the, uh, at the um, uh, inputs. Of course, it would probably be easier to show that with an assign uh, statement, which we'll see in a, in a moment, but this is one way to describe just a um, combinational AND gate, okay? There are no clock signals as you see here, okay? Another thing is it's very, very important that everything that happens on the right-hand side, we call this the RHS, the right-hand side of the equals, okay? And this we call the left-hand side. 
Anything on the right hand side has to appear in the sensitivity list, otherwise we have to save state. Okay, so um, very important to pay attention to it. We'll see that when we discuss uh, design styles or gotchas a bit later. So um, just to, to, to make sure that we don't actually forget anything, and actually it's pretty easy to understand that anything over here should be appear over here in the sensitivity list. In Verilog 2001, they made a, an update to the standard in 2001 that you can use this uh, operator called a star. So a star goes and looks at everything on the right-hand side and sticks it automatically into the sensitivity list. So what we write is always at star, out equals a and b and c and then we if we add another signal or remove a signal um, we don't have to update the sensitivity list which it was a, uh, a common cause for bugs in Verilog code before that so um, our uh, recommendation is always to use this always at star notation our next um, bullet is about assignments so assignment is um, is something that uh, basically shows a combinational logic. So we just saw a second ago um, how to do combinational logic with an always block, but that's not the only way to do it. We can do it in a few ways. So one of them is what we call an assigned statement. So if we would just want to make a simple or a pretty simple um, uh, type of, a, uh, of, of a, an expression, something that describes basically a structural, some sort of an OR gate or AND gate or something that we know about pretty well, what we'll do is we'll use an assigned statement often. So for example, we can describe a MUX in this way. Um, assign, then this is the name of the output of the, of the signal, the MUX out, equals and we have something here so we this or this what's inside here we have a signal called cell and a signal called in one or not signal called cell and in one um and in one and in zero so what we get is mux out equals right we have cell times in one or uh, um plus cell not times in zero okay that is exactly a multiplexer right it has cell over here for the zero it gets in zero and for the one it gets in one um, we can describe that with this ternary operator which is kind of a nicer way to, to, to write the same thing so assign mux out if cell equals one then we um, output in one, else we output in zero. So this is equivalent to writing if cell, um, then mux out equals in one, else mux out equals in zero. That's equivalent to writing that. It's just kind of a short and nice notation. Okay, our second type of a, uh, procedural block is I'm just erasing that because it's in the way of my uh, slide here is we have a, a blocking procedural assignment or an equals okay and we saw that we used equals inside assigns on the previous slide but we didn't describe it so in a, in an equal assignment we're actually going back to kind of a, a sequential type of a programming language a standard uh, programming language or what we call blocking because whatever equals is here it blocks whatever happens after it so the the right hand side is executed and assignment is completed before the next state, state statement is executed so I have a comment here assume that initially a equals one okay and then inside my assignment we have a statement that says a equals two now this is blocking so now a equals two and then b equals a so at the end of our code here a equals two what was written here and b equals two because it was blocking okay it happened before this because it came before it inside our code then uh, then again there's something that we call a non-blocking procedural assignment or a, um, a left pointing arrow equals okay so a non-blocking assignment we actually do the right hand side um, at the end of the current time step. A time step is a uh, singular type of a uh, feature inside our simulator, but at the end of the current time step, so it's uh, uh, an epsilon amount of time after uh, the beginning of the time step, we do the assignment. So what happens is we take the same exact 
code, right? Initially, a equals one, and then we have this um, this non-blocking assignment. And what it happens is a gets two. When does it get two? Only at the end of the current time step. B gets a. When does that happen? Only at the end of the current time step. But a is what it was at the beginning of the current time step. At the beginning of the current time step, it was it was one. So at the end of the current time step, when a is updated and B is updated, A is updated to 2, but B is updated to what A was initially, which is 1. So A equals 2, B equals 1. So you see we have pretty much the same code, but the, uh, the, the output is very different. And this is uh, very confusing, and it can cause you to make mistakes. But we have four rules that will tell you exactly how not to ever make a mistake with this to ensure that all simulators and everything happens exactly as you um, wanted it to. So what you do is you have to follow these four rules. First of all, in a combinational always block, so that's always at star, right? You will always, always, always use a bl blocking assignment, the equals. In a sequential always block, you will always, always, always use a non-blocking assignment. Um, just to understand the uh, logic behind that, Okay, the equals is showing a combinational type of a tree. So we have an AND gate, we may have something like an AND gate followed by an OR gate followed by an XOR gate or something like that. So this is happening before this is happening before this. Okay. On the other hand, inside our sequential block, we have a flip-flop, right? That when the clock rises, whatever was here goes over here. In the meantime, maybe stuff changes over here and it changes what was at the input, but we sampled what was uh, at the input at the beginning of the cycle. So that's what the non-blocking assignment does. So if we keep those two rules, we'll always use an equals or a blocking assignment in a combinatorial uh, block, in a combinational block, and always use a non-blocking assignment in a sequential block, where it will be fine. Okay? Another thing is, I mean, it comes out of that, is do not mix blocking and non-blocking assignments in the same always block. And something very, very important, never, never assign the same variable for more than one always block. What would be assigning more than one variable? Say we had one always block that described some AND gate, right? But the output was AND out. And then some other one was said it was AND out. So basically, these two are shorted together. And we can't do that, okay? So that's a no-no, never do this. So you only can assign to the same variable from one always block. You can use the same variable many times on the right-hand side, but it should only appear on the left-hand side in one always block. Okay, now I'll discuss how we write a module in Verilog and how we instantiate hierarchy. So a module is used to define a hardware block. So how do we make a full mux for example so we have this mux4 okay and the mux4 um, it has four inputs a bus of four inputs and it has a selector of two outputs so this is a mux right it has one two three four inputs zero 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 one one zero one one and it has an output and these are called in zero in one in two and in three right and it has an output called um, out and it has a selector called cell one two zero right okay so that's what we did here and we see that we use this output as a reg and we'll describe discuss why later so we do always at star because this is purely combinational there's no clock in here and then we use the case statement, similar to a case in C. And we ask, what happens with cell? Now, cell is on the right-hand side. And so it goes into the sensitivity list because it's always at star. So when cell changes, when we change the selector here, okay, what happens? Um, if it is equal to 0, 0, then out gets in 0. That describes that. If it's equal to 0, 1, out gets 1, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we reach all of those and we haven't selected any of them, then we write a default. And default, we output X's. Um, so uh, that's just a fall through state. If we accidentally fall through all of these, it means we say somebody accidentally deleted this line, then we output X's at the end. So it will appear in our simulator. 
Okay, so that's how we write a full module. We end it with n module. Now we have described this mux. There is this mux in the world. It's a, some sort of a component that exists, and we'll also put it in its own uh, file, usually called mux4.v. Okay, that's our module of a mux. Now, what we're going to do with it, we're going to use this mux often and all over the place. Okay, so just as an example, uh, by the way, that's called the header, and this is called the body of the module. So we're going to use this mux all over the place. So we're going to do it. What we're going to do is we're going to instantiate it. So in another module somewhere else, we reference the blocks or instantiate it. So there were module blah blah blah, and then we write mux for. That's the name of this module. Okay, and we call it m0. That's a first. That's a first instantiation of it. Here's mux4 and a second instantiation of it. So what we did is we actually made two muxes here. This one we call m0. This one we call m1. Okay, and as you see, this one is connected to out a. This one's to out b. How do I see that? As you see here, we have this dot notation. So each and every one of the ports that was um, that was described here in zero, in one, in two, in three, out and cell one and cell d zero. We will write them with a dot here, okay? Dot out is the output of this, and we say that's connected to a wire that belongs to the higher level module, and that wire is called out a. Dot in, and we don't have to write all four of them, it's enough to write just the name of the bus, is uh, hooked up to a, so um, these guys are hooked up to a0, a1, etc., assuming that a is a 4-bit bus, okay? And cell is connected to cell 1 to 0 assuming cell is a 2-bit bus at the higher level this one is also connected to cell so these two are actually shorted together but these guys are connected to b0 b1 etc okay that's what we see here um, you can also do this by order so we could write the uh, first we could write uh, in which would be a comma then cell then comma then out a and that would be okay so we could have uh, written mux4 m0 um, and then we could have written uh, in cell out a but the problem is if somebody would come over here and change the order that it was written in the module here this would stop working so and it's also less readable so you don't want to do that and you'll see often that machines output this type of a style though Last thing maybe about this type of thing is a system task. There are lots of system tasks in variable there in Verilog. There are things that tell the simulator um, to do all kinds of uh, things that can help us debug and help us uh, do things in the simulation. So uh, system tasks start with a dollar sign. So dollar sign and whatever the name of the um, system task is. And just example, we have dollar sign display or dollar sign dollar sign strobe. They print. Uh, they print something out to the log file once a statement is executed. We have dollar monitor. Every time there's a change in one of the parameters, it will print out whatever we wrote. And since these are all print type of commands, they uh, take a C style printf format. So for example, we can do dollar display. Uh, then we use a, a pair of quotation marks. Inside the quotation marks, we use this uh, percentage uh, type of thing, which uh, you probably are familiar with from C. So we write at percentage T, value of out is percentage B slash N, and then percentage T uh, maps to dollar time, which returns the time of the system, and or uh, the time of the simulation, etc. Uh, excuse me. And, do, uh, and percentage B returns a, a binary number, which is out. The signal out okay so that type of a thing can help us debug and print inside our simulation though we can also use um, waveform viewers which give us a graphical user interface to look at these things